Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining and thanks for your patience. We'll get going in just a few minutes here, but I um, want to allow some time for everyone to join. So uh, thank you, and we'll get going in just a bit. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us all today um, for the first in a series of five Western Governors Species Conservation and Endangered Species Act Initiative webinars. Today's webinar is titled Voluntary Species Conservation Incentives and Collaboration. I'm Zach Bodain, Policy Advisor for Wildlife and Lands at the Western Governors Association. Quick logistical reminder, if you're in need of technical assistance, please message Amy Schweig through the WebEx application or call WGA at 303-623-9378. Before I introduce our moderator and panelists, I'd like to describe the Western Governor's Species Conservation and ESA Initiative and go over a few logistical details for the webinar. The Western Governor's Species Conservation and ESA Initiative is the chairman initiative of Governor Matt Mead of Wyoming. Through the initiative, WGA intends to create a framework for states to share best practices in species management, promote and elevate the role of states in species conservation efforts, and explore ways to improve the efficacy of the Endangered Species Act. The effort, however, will go beyond consideration of ESA and examine and highlight innovations related to species management and conservation and consider means by which state resources can be better leveraged. A few logistical details. Um, joined today by our moderator, Terry Fankhauser, Executive Vice President of the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. I'll let the panelists introduce themselves in just a moment. But for the flow of the webinar, each panelist will deliver brief opening remarks to frame the discussion for the remainder of the webinar. Following those remarks, Terry will ask a few questions of the panelists to begin the discussion. After a moderated discussion amongst panelists, we will open up the Q&A session to all attendees. All general attendees are currently on mute, so to ask a question, you will need to use the chat function through WebEx. If you have a question, Please write the question in the chat box in your bottom right, and be sure that you've selected the option to address your chat question directly to me, Zach Bodain. 
Our goal is to have a recording of this webinar available by tomorrow. Um, it's an ambitious goal, but we will try to have it out by the end of the day. Uh, again, for any technical assistance, please be sure to message Amy Schweig through the WebEx application or call WGA at 303-623-9378. And with all that said, I'd like to turn things over to our moderator, Terry Fankhauser. Terry? Thank you, Dan. Um, let's start with just a bit of a sound check on our end. I'm sure if you can't hear me at this point, you'll let me know. All right, very well. Um, I'm going to make a few introductory remarks and then just give a general outline of the panelists. And I think the panelists will go ahead and introduce themselves in more depth as they do their presentation, tell you a little bit about where they sit and where they stand uh, related to this issue. Uh, again, my name is Terry Fankhauser. I'm the Executive Vice President with the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. Our organization has an interest in this work with the black-footed ferret primarily around the uh, value uh, and the structure of the conservation program and the assurances that go along with it. We think it's well designed and we have been uh, actively engaged uh, throughout the process. So it's a pleasure for us to be involved here today. On behalf of Western Governors Association, uh, welcome to this informative and engaging discussion on voluntary conservation incentives and most importantly, successful collaboration. Uh, I'll repeat some of what uh, Western Governors Association staff, Dan, uh, iterated, but it's very important. Uh, this is a first of se uh, several series of webinars uh, in and around the topic of endangered species, obviously something that's not only important to the people uh, presenting today, but uh, the fair number of individuals, and I think we're looking at 39 or 40 people at this time, that have tuned in across the United States for this webinar. Um, and this is under the direction, as indicated by Dan, of Governor Mead from Wyoming. He's the current chair of the Western Governors Association. Some might think that this is a, a topic that lacks engagement, but to the contrary, most Western states are investing unprecedented time and resources in order to maintain stable business and regulatory environments for their citizens. Governor Mead, uh, in his special initiative, will address three core elements. And again, I'm going to restate uh, what those elements are because I find them to be very important. The first being to create a mechanism for states to share best practices in species management. The second, to promote and elevate the role of states in species conservation efforts. And the third being to explore ways to improve efficacy of the Endangered Species Act. Without a doubt, I think this is important to, uh, to all of us on this webinar today and many more that couldn't join us. The initiative will accomplish these goals using a variety of methods, including workshops, webinars, as we indicated, like this one, ultimately a resource library, comments, feedback from interested stakeholders, including you on the phone. Once completed, the information developed through this process is designed to yield recommendations for improvement to state species conservation activities, as well as the Endangered Species Act. Those pathways for states to operate as authentic partners in the Act's implementation. Again, a piece found to be very important. So without further delay, let's jump into a discussion surrounding a collaborative approach engaging federal and state agencies and stakeholders from conservation landowner communities with the goal to recover what has been called the most endangered mammal in North America. We invite you to learn about the black-footed ferret, but more importantly, the conservation approach to address the species that was once thought to be extinct. I'm going to overview the panelists and then we'll march through them in that order and they'll tell you a bit more about themselves. Todd Heward is a rancher from Wyoming that has a very close connection uh, to the Black-Footed Ferret Range and he'll tell you more about that. We have Pete Gober here. Pete is the longtime Black-Footed Ferret Recovery Program Lead for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Ken Morgan. Ken is the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Private Lands Program Manager. Tom Doherty, Tom's worked for years on this topic and is from the National Wildlife Federation. And ultimately, John Emmerich, uh, he is the retired Deputy Director of the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. 
So let's move at this point in time to Todd Hewart. Todd, if you would like to take your presentation forward. Thank you and good morning. I appreciate your time. Uh, I also, as a landowner, would like to thank the Western Governors Association and Chairman Mead for their interest and efforts uh, on uh, species conservation and uh, the initiative on the Endangered Species Act. As mentioned, uh, I am a rancher in south central Wyoming uh, between Casper and Medicine Bow in the Shirley Basin. Interestingly enough, uh, we live here in one of the, the few remaining true grasslands uh, ecosystems left in the world. That provides us with a great opportunity to witness uh, some spectacular wildlife, uh, to share our day-to-day -day life with them. Certainly our, our lifestyle uh, is a bit different than most of society in that we do live every day uh, with, with the wildlife um, and uh, have that great opportunity. Uh, because of that different lifestyle, uh, you know, uh, we see wildlife uh, certainly in a, a different aspect than the recreationists who view them or hunt them. We even see them differently than the agency folks who uh, strive to manage them. Uh, we are with them every single day. As a fifth generation uh, rancher, my children uh, that work beside me are sixth generation uh, my family homestead here in 1909. We run uh, sheep and cattle um, and have always been fond of uh, the wildlife aspect. Um, it's an important part of what we do in the fact that oftentimes those wildlife are endangered. And so we have to take into consideration uh, every management decision we make, uh, certainly and the effects that it might have on uh, species that are sensitive or threatened or endangered. Uh, a great example has been the sage grouse in recent years. We have a lot of sage grouse. Uh, we do have uh, the great opportunity to have uh, the black-footed ferret, the swift fox, uh, and many other species here on the ranch. Um, one of the things that uh, that does for landowners in general, not just us, is create a lot of concern uh, when those, those wildlife species are, are endangered or threatened or uh, in those different statuses. And with that often comes regulatory concerns. Um, and uh, that's certainly an uneasiness oftentimes for somebody trying to make a living. <clears throat> uh, that was certainly the case when uh, the Wyoming Game and Fish and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service <clears throat> came to landowners in the Shirley Basin area and uh, asked about uh, a reintroduction program in 1991 of the black-footed ferret. Um, you know, landowners at that time had to certainly consider the implications of that, specifically when it came to regulatory concerns. Because of the 10J status that was placed upon black-footed ferrets in the Shirley Basin at that time, landowners felt that they could uh, accept the potential regulatory uh, concerns and assurances provided by the 10J. Um, and so we supported the effort of, of that reintroduction program in 1991. It has proven to be, uh, you know, effective uh, in the fact that that 10J has provided those assurances over the past 25 years. We've been allowed to maintain our operation in a way that uh, has not affected the ferrets, uh, nor has it affected our business. And, and we felt that that's uh, been beneficial to us and to the species in that uh, reintroduction effort. Um, so we as, as a landowner, continue to support uh, the effort locally for black-footed ferret recovery. We participate in, in that oftentimes when they do uh, surveys and such. But uh, with the proposed um, conservation effort uh, 
Currently with U.S. Fish and Wildlife to further black-footed ferret uh, reintroduction, we support that also. We feel that, uh, you know, the plan that has been laid out uh, through a proposed voluntary conservation effort by private landowners uh, is a critical part of that and would allow uh, further introductions throughout the West to be successful. Uh, as an endangered species, um, the black-footed ferret I believe can be recovered and be listed. It, it sits in a position uh, where that success could be seen, which is perhaps uh, rare, uh, I think, when it comes to the Endangered Species Act. Uh, we don't see that happen, and which is a frustrating thing for landowners. I think the conservation plan that has been put forth for black-footed ferret recovery is based more on science and less on, on politics, which is often uh, a big problem when it comes to the Endangered Species Act. Certainly, uh, there, there are no free lunches when it comes to uh, species recovery, uh, species management, um, and uh, that's important uh, to recognize that uh, there's always a cost. Uh, there's some responsibilities that need to be shared and, and, and taken care of. Uh, Black-footed ferret uh, is no, no different. Um, I think the cost and the responsibility, the cost in particular for the recovery of it is something that uh, needs to be looked at closely and shared by all those who benefit from it. Um, I'm not here to necessarily uh, support any specific funding mechanism. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, I, I'm one that feels that fish and wildlife uh, should be the mechanism by which species are recovered, uh, and that should always be first consideration and, and looked at. Um, but as a priv private landowner, um, we would continue to support uh, activities related to recovery of the black-footed ferret. I think the the voluntary incentive program can be uh, an effective mechanism to do that um, by which uh, landowners can be appreciated and, and respected for their role of providing the habitat necessary for wildlife species. With that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Todd. Let's move now to Pete Gober with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, uh, my name is Pete Gober. I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, have for nearly 30 years or so. I've worked from Texas where I grew up, up to Montana, all through the range of the west of the ferret and prairie dog on a number of different things from golden eagles and bald eagles and coyotes and livestock depredations to ferrets and prairie dogs. Um, Anyone raised in the rural west knows that sometimes there can be conflicts between making a living on, on a farm or ranch and wildlife. And that seems pretty obvious to a number of us, but it's not so obvious, I don't think, to the majority of Americans. Uh, most folks get a weekly paycheck and don't have to worry about quarterly taxes or whether it's going to rain or what feed prices are or whether they can find labor. Uh, but folks that are trying to make a living on the land do. Recognizing this, uh, we've gathered together over several years from many parts of the West, quite a few folks with the background to help the ferret, and at the same time, the ferret, the most endangered mammal in North America, and not help people who live and work, hurt people who live and work on the land. So our strategy with ferret recovery has been to help wildlife, don't hurt the landowners, and perhaps provide a model for endangered species recovery that can work for all interests. You might advance the slide, please, and I'll talk about some uh, challenges that we have had to meet in order to try to address this in a, just a few minutes here as far as an introduction. We've got a pretty good track record with ferrets, but then we've been working at it for several decades. Like Todd said, the first ferrets went back out in the wild after we captive bred them from near extinction in 91. And sequentially over the years, we've gotten 27 sites scattered across eight states, Mexico and Canada. That's taken a lot of coordination efforts with people, as you can imagine. Private lands have played a huge part. Tribal lands have played a huge part, and public lands have helped. 
Let's advance the slide. Uh, next slide. So, you know, you, you have to take your problems in order and uh, go from one to the other and try to sweep them aside in order to get where you want to go. And one of the first things we thought about was, are we going to be able to even do this? And from very few ferrets rescued from northwestern Wyoming back in the mid-80s, we've been able to successfully capture breed ferrets, thousands of ferrets, and put them back on the landscape. So we can capture breed ferrets, we can reintroduce ferrets, and as a result, we have a source of animals to where we don't have to be overly concerned with the fate of every one that might go out into the landscape. Next slide. Right on the heels of figuring out whether you can do it biologically, of course, though, is whether you can make people comfortable in accepting ferrets. And the Endangered Species Act causes a fair amount of concern for a variety of reasons across the West. We've sought to diminish those concerns by uh, developing techniques such as experimental non-essential population that Todd mentioned, the 10J that was first exercised in Wyoming in 1991. Uh, recent date over the last couple of years, we found a way to work specifically with private landowners through the programmatic safe harbor agreement. And basically what this has done is created a no harm, no foul situation. You can get involved with ferrets and proceed without concerns about ESA impacting your daily operations. Next slide. So there are a number of different challenges out there, you know, beyond captive breeding and reintroducing them on the landscape. We've got to worry about an invasive disease, silvatic plague that can uh, hurt prairie dogs and hurt ferrets, and of course ferrets uh, depend exclusively on prairie dogs. We've got to also be concerned about wherever we promote ferrets, we've got to have prairie dogs, so we've got to worry about boundary control issues for neighbors who may not want to have prairie dogs or ferrets. Next slide. Uh, there are a number of different social challenges, as you can imagine, too. People have got to want them or we're not going to be able to take them there, and we've got to convince them that it's not going to hurt them or their neighbors. Next slide. Uh, one thing to think about here is our recovery goal is 3,000 adult ferrets across 12 states. That's a fairly modest goal. And when you work out the numbers of where prairie dogs can be across the West, they're an incredibly resilient species, we're looking at one one thousandths of the landscape to put ferrets back on. So basically, if we can find a few confident landowners whose situation is such that they're willing to put up with a few prairie dogs in certain circumstances and ferrets, then it's only going to be a handful of landowners on t uh, in each individual state. And I should mention, too, that we would like to spread ferrets out across all these states just as a risk management tool so that drought and plague won't hammer everything that we may have put back out all at one time. Next slide, please. So it's a big rock to push uphill. After 100 years of fighting prairie dogs, uh, people have got to think of a new way of doing business, a few people, and a few have, whose circumstances have allowed it. The, the walkers here on the left in uh, Colorado were the first to take advantage of the uh, programmatic safe harbor agreement with ferrets. It worked for them. It pro it's not going to work for a lot of their neighbors, but there's a lot of, uh, of talk that has to take place before these sort of things can move forward. Let's next slide, please. Next slide. So this is an example that doesn't, well, I think the slide we've got up, we're disconnected. Okay, well, you may still be on the line. We lost our screen there for a moment. But this is just a schematic of all the different uh, recovery team committees and folks working and trying to make sure everybody's in the loop as we move forward with uh, designing a plan to achieve ferret recovery. Next slide. This is our uh, three-legged stool. We tried to simplify what we're trying to accomplish, the, the seat of the stool being where we want to get uh, at some point in time. We think we could do it in a fairly short order because ferrets have a pretty high reproductive rate, and if we can manage their habitat, we think we could achieve recovery even within a decade. So one leg of the stool being we've got to address regulatory concerns. We think we've done that pretty well. Another leg of the stool being landowner incentives in, a, in addition to not kicking anybody in the shin because 
we're not going to hammer them with any regulatory uh, impacts. We've got to also consider any kind of offset for decreased forage availability for their livestock. And NRCS has really moved forward with that in the state of Colorado, and it's one of the reasons Ken may talk about in a minute that we've had as much interest as we have in Colorado. And in situations in Kansas, for example, where we've had uh, uh, concerns with neighbors of prairie dogs spilling out from ferry areas, we've managed to control a lot of prairie dogs. The, the real 900-pound gorilla in the room is plague management, and we're going to have to have some help from APHIS Wildlife Services with both the boundary control issue and with plague management. And they have stepped up and done that on a limited uh, basis. Where we are now is about 10% toward our recovery goal. We've got a few hundred ferrets on the landscape at a number of these different sites. Uh, we think if we could get the management resources, we could achieve that full recovery goal over the long term. That's it for me. Thank you, Pete. We'll now move to Ken Morgan with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Well, good morning. Uh, as Terry said, my name is Ken Morgan. I, I am the private lands manager uh, for Colorado Parks and Wildlife in that position. My job is to help develop management plans specifically uh, for uh, rare, threatened, and endangered species, as well as working with all the ag community, as well as working with NRCS. So we, we cover all sorts of gamuts with that, uh, with that opportunity. I also serve as the chairman of the incentive committee on the Blackfoot Barrett Executive uh, Recovery Team. So, um, next slide, please. We've already talked a little bit about voluntary incentive-based programs, but I will reiterate that uh, every ag group, at least in Colorado, has within their policy doctrine that they're, they are in favor of recovery of threatened and endangered species under voluntary incentive-based programs with a non-regulatory approach. And that is specifically what the Black-Footed Ferret uh, opportunities that we are providing provide for landowners. The Safe Harbor Agreement is without question one of the best documents I've seen in about 41 years of working on private land management that, that not only protects the landowner, <coughs> excuse me, from uh, from regulatory uh, oversight, but also protects their neighbors and anybody who might be impacted by our recovery efforts. And uh, this this was absolutely critical to Colorado specifically moving forward with this. Next slide, please. In Colorado, uh, the black tail prairie dog uh, Acreage is primarily in eastern Colorado, and 88% of uh, eastern Colorado is in private ownership. So, if, obviously, within our state, if we were to recover uh, grassland species, we have to have uh, a, a complete trust and working relationship with all the private landowners uh, and especially the ag groups that represent them. And it, I got to point out at this time that none of this would have happened in Colorado uh, without the acceptance and leadership of the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. We had to go through state legislative authority in order to uh, allow reintroduction of black-footed ferrets in Colorado, and during those hearings, the Cattlemen's Association were standing right side by side with Colorado Parks and Wildlife to make that happen. And uh, that, again, none of this would have happened without that occurring. Next slide, please. So we've, we've kind of touched uh, several times on safe harbor agreement, but um, this document allows landowners a high degree of acceptance that a deal is a deal. It's in writing. We're not going to change uh, our approaches. We're not going to change our objectives. We're not going to change anything about black-footed recovery that is not stated in that safe harbor agreement. And for for a good number of landowners that, that we work with anyway, the, the highest incentive you can provide is just that. The monetary incentives are, are very important, obviously, but the you can't get to the level of talking about monetary incentives without having uh, a good guarantee that uh, the contract is a contract, and that's where we're going to stay with. Uh, the, the, the buzzwords to all that is no, no harm, no foul, and that's to anybody that is involved with this process. Next slide, please. 
So we, we uh, Pete talked about NRCS stepping up uh, as partners for incentives for landowners. And in Colorado, uh, Colorado was the first to, to take the step working with NRCS uh, and to, to provide uh, incentives through EQIP, Environmental Quality Incentive Program, um, which is a three-year contract that gives payment to landowners for producing certain things for benefit of wildlife species. The, when we rolled this out, our state conservationist, who at that time was Phyllis Phillips, who has since retired, uh, was, got very excited about this program and pulled out all stops to, to get, get these opportunities on the ground. Our first application period, we received 53 applications from private landowners to receive the most endangered mammal in North America. And I think that just speaks volumes as to if build it right and folks will certainly come and want to be participants in the process. Uh, we are continuing to work with, uh, with NRCS and trying to model other programs that might uh, be adaptable to this opportunity as well. Uh, but we, we still continue in Colorado to be working under EQIP. We're looking at CSP. We still have landowners that are interested in, in becoming involved in the program. Basically, the EQIP is a three-year contract, as I said, and the landowners are paid a, a, a dollar amount per acreage uh, for the total number of acres of occupied prairie dogs within, within the management area. And there is a, a boundary within that management area that they are paid on that those acreages as well. And again, that's for a period of three years. Uh, next slide, please. We we already talked about Colorado Cattlemen's Association, but uh, this this entire operation involved uh, everybody that that Pete has already pointed out. That uh, Colorado Cattlemen's Association. Farm Bureau, to some degree, uh, did not oppose what we were doing, and that, that's good enough for us. That was wonderful. Uh, the NRCS, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Wildlife Services, but most importantly, the private landowners and, and the organizations that represent those landowners. And clearly, uh, I think we have demonstrated in Colorado that under this type of opportunity, we could produce this same type of effort on other potentially listed species or already listed species if everything is put into place as has been with black-footed ferret. The critical aspect to this, as Pete already pointed out, is with that comes a, a necessity of, of continued funding. Specifically in this case, we, we have told landowners that part of the deal that we are offering is that we will do our best to manage for sylvatic plague uh, and do our best to manage the boundaries of those prairie dog complexes to make sure they don't get on neighboring properties. That all takes money, and that's something that uh, we are continuing to work, uh, work on through uh, all, all those agencies, both at the D.C. level and at the region level. Next slide, please. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ken. We'll now move to Tom Doherty. Uh, Tom, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Doherty. Uh, I actually was uh, have been associated with black-footed ferrets from the beginning. They were discovered in Matitsi, Wyoming, in 1981. Uh, I must say that. Until very recently, I have been was very pessimistic about being able to recover the black-footed ferret for some monumental reasons. One, we captured, uh, we brought in the, the wild ferrets from Matitsi into a captive breeding program, and nobody had ever bred black-footed ferrets, and so there were some amazing uh, aspects in the uh, genetics and technological field that were overcome uh, and uh, and 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 which somewhat certainly stagger my imagination uh, I uh, I 
went to work for National Wildlife Federation in 1984 uh, and uh, have since retired. Uh, I spent over 40 years uh, in the conservation community and have been associated with almost all of the, the uh, 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 programs, um, Black-Footed Ferret Advisory Committee uh, and the the Friends Group, and I, uh, it really wasn't until the application and the confidences of people like Terry Frankhauser and, and Todd and others that the safe harbor agreement and the experimental non-essential designation, the 10J, uh, because we became aware that there's not enough prairie dogs on public lands to recover the species. Without the assistance of private land participation on a voluntary basis and tribal lands, there's little hope that we would ever reach the recovery goal uh, that had been established. I now believe that with the uh, t technological advancements in plague management, uh, the uh, the uh, recent and, and very successful um, uh, arrangements associated with with the safe harbor and private uh, landowner uh, and incentive. Uh, voluntary incentive-based programs uh, have, for the first time, led me to believe that 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 a recovery of this species is uh, is possible. I uh, uh, reiterate that I think tribal lands continue to be part of the uh, answer uh, on, on recovery, and I am <clears throat> so encouraged by the participation of, of the private landowners that have already uh, signed up and look forward. Uh, we, there are still tremendous obstacles, but not monumental obstacles that there was in the very beginning, and, and most of those are funding. I, I'm in total agreement with uh, Pete's three-legged stool analysis that the partnerships that between the state, the federal, tribal, and private citizens, and and conservation organizations. I, I don't, as I said, I don't pretend to speak for the entire conservation community. I don't even intend to speak for National Wildlife Federation because I'm retired from there. But I have seen nothing but, but but a bright light at the end of the tunnel that's getting bigger and bigger. And and the uh, advent of of uh, being able to uh, to really look at private lands as a mechanism with which to recover uh, uh, black-footed ferrets have uh, greatly increased my optimism and uh, and and hope that we 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 can achieve this goal thank you thank you Tom let's move now to John Emmerich for his comments <clears throat> thank you Terry uh, I'm John Emmerich. As uh, Terry mentioned earlier, I served as the deputy director with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department uh, in the uh, well, for seven years. I retired in 2013, and, and when I was serving as deputy director, I also served as the chair of the Blackfooted Ferret Recovery Implementation Team's Executive Committee, and that's the organization that's. Um, sponsored by the Fish and Wildlife Service that has members from all the various agencies uh, associated with the recovery plan, uh, conservation organizations, and other groups. And we worked together for seven years trying to promote uh, Blackfoot or Ferret recovery. And uh, as I was working on that committee, one of the things that we decided we needed to do was to promote a little different approach, more of a programmatic approach of incentives to try to bring the private landowner uh, within this recovery effort and, and, and participate on a, on a larger scale. And uh, since I retired, uh, as with Tom, I no longer speak for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, but uh, based on my experience and involvement in the program, I am thoroughly convinced that, that this is the way to approach 
uh, Blackfoot of Barrett recovery and probably re the recovery of many other uh, threatened or endangered or sensitive species. And that is the voluntary, non-regulatory, incentive-based approach that we that we have developed for black-footed ferrets. Uh, because of my uh, uh, optimism and uh, I'm convinced that we can get these species recovered, uh, I'm basically volunteering, um, serving as a volunteer with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they cover my travel, which helps, but uh, I volunteer my time because I think this is a, a worthy cause and something that can be accomplished within the next 10 years. Um, so in that role, as Pete mentioned and others have mentioned, we still obviously have challenges, uh, no longer monumental, but certainly tremendous. And uh, as Pete mentioned, some of the big challenges are dealing with plague and uh, also developing uh, a program, basically institutionalizing a program that can actually deliver the boundary control that we've talked about so that neighbors um, don't have to be concerned about prey dogs moving to places where they don't want them. And also um, institutionalize the programs that help manage plague, not only manage it on the ground, but also develop tools that we can effectively manage plague with. And all of that basically boils down to money, <laughs> having the dollars in place to uh, make these programs uh, long-term and essentially institutionalized. Uh, as I was serving as chair on the recovery implementation team, we were successful in, in getting resolutions developed by the state Wyoming Game and Fish, or state Game and Fish agencies in the 12 states that support prairie dogs and potentially ferret recovery. We also, we also uh, got a signed MOU between all the uh, affected agencies, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Wildlife, APHIS Wildlife Services, um, Natural Resource Conservation Service, USGS, uh, and of course the uh, state uh, wildlife agencies, agreeing that this is a worthy program that we, we support and we want to continue to do what we can to make it work. So I guess we have the written and verbal commitments, and uh, but the one thing that was kind of obvious that we, we need to work on, and the reason I did volunteer my, I'm volunteering my time, is we, we need some advocacy to make this thing get successful, to get us over the top. And again, that boils down to uh, uh, getting the money needed to make this thing successful. Why don't you turn to the next, uh, next slide. So what we, we decided to do within the committee just before I retired, we thought it was important to put together a non-agency group of individuals uh, that could provide advocacy and support for this overall effort. And so I agreed to chair, and that's what I'm doing is chairing what we're calling the Black-Footed Ferret Friends. And our mission statement, as you can see in this slide, is to promote this incentive-based voluntary Black-Footed Ferret Recovery Program. Uh, with measurable conservation goals. And the recovery plan is very specific. We're basically trying to achieve and, and maintain uh, 3,000 adult uh, ferrets on the landscape uh, through at least nine of the 12 potential states that could support those, those ferrets. And what that bo basically boils down to is, is purposefully managing in terms of boundary control, plague management, maintaining prairie dogs on the landscape of about 500,000 acres scattered among these nine to 12 states. We have more than two million acres of prairie dogs on the landscape right now, so we're not talking about adding prairie dogs, we're just talking about purposely managing those prairie dogs. And again, it gets me back to the point, it takes dollars to do that. Wildlife Services is, um, doing what they can with their very limited resources to address boundary control and plague management. Uh, NRCS has participated through EQIP to try to provide some incentives as an initial trial. Uh, but the Friends Group is, is promoting this program in several ways. One, through advocacy, promotion, you know, going around, talking to various agricultural and conservation organizations. Uh, landowners definitely have to be involved in this program if we're going to be successful and part of our mission is to try to educate them so they can make up their minds to see if this is something that they want to participate in. And also we're meeting with the federal and state agency heads that uh, have the final say in terms of what their commitments are going to be within their agencies such as the NRCS, Fish and Wildlife Service, USGS. And also this friends group is doing some 
a lobbying advocacy group with uh, congressional staffers and uh, hopefully in the future some congressional members as well. Um, and another part of our mission is to is, is education, you know, using printed materials, website posts, and presentations. So as chair of that group, we're, again, we, we are kind of the arm that's, that's providing the advocacy to try to get us over the top in terms of, of funding. And uh, next slide, please. Say one of our activities uh, last late July last year, uh, this, these are most of the members of the Friends Group. Uh, I'll mention that there's currently 10 members. Uh, myself makes 11, but of those 10 members, four represent the livestock industry. Uh, Todd Hewart, uh, who you already heard from, who's the owner manager of the Todd uh, Hewart Ranches there out of Medicine Bow. He's also the current president of the Wyoming Livestock Board. Mark Isley, he's the fellow in the picture with the black hat, but he's been involved in this Blackfoot of Ferret Recovery Initiative for, for many, many years. He's a past president of the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. Of course, you've heard from Terry. Terry's also a member of our friends group, and he's the vice executive director for the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. And uh, Billy Cardasco is also a member from Arizona who's uh, owner manager of the uh, of Babbitt Ranches in Arizona. So those are the four livestock uh, interest members. We're also trying to recruit an individual from Montana. We have uh, four individuals representing conservation organizations. Uh, Christy Bly with the World Wildlife Fund, Tom Doherty, who you've heard from, who was involved in the course of the Wildlife Federation for many, many years. Uh, Steve Olson with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, who, who that organization has been very involved in the captive breeding program and, and the genetics work for, for recovery. And uh, the, let's see, we got Christy, Steve, and America Pinterbure, who is also with um, the uh, uh, WWF. WWF, World Wildlife Fund. So uh, the World Wildlife Fund and AZA, America, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, have also provided some dollars support to help cover our meeting costs, travel costs, and those sort of things. And, uh, and finally, and not last at all, we also have tribal representation on the, on the Friends Group. As mentioned earlier, they've been a very big player in terms of uh, reintroduction of ferrets and recovery of ferrets in, se in several locations. Uh, a very successful release is, is, occurs in Arizona on Navajo lands, and several releases, successful releases have occurred in South Dakota. Uh, on uh, the Lower Brewer Reservation, Cheyenne River Reservation, some other reservations. So the Friends Group right now represents those three primary players. And uh, like I say, our, our mission is to really promote this program uh, through advocacy work. One more slide, please. And again, that's the members that I just went through. Uh, there's 10 individuals, and we're continuing to look for recruiting others, in particular folks from the livestock industry uh, from the various states that potentially would participate in this program. And the reason is we need their input in terms of developing the program that they think will work, uh, but also they, they're the ones that primarily are affected and could primarily benefit from this program. And so we really need their support uh, across the board. And I'll just leave, I'll leave my presentation with, we're willing to travel to any state. That's basically North Dakota to Texas, Montana, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, to uh, provide a presentation on this program, uh, to go to your uh, livestock association, whatever you would want. Uh, you contact me, we'll organize a group, and we'll come talk to you. Thank you, John. So what we're going to do at this point is move into a bit of a moderated discussion with the panelists. And what I'd like to do is, is we're going to ask uh, a series of questions and succinctly in about 10 or 15 seconds to 20 seconds, I'd like to get an opinion uh, from at least an individual on the panel. And I'll try to call some names, but if other, one, if other panelists have some compelling uh, information, uh, go ahead and bring it in. We'll try not to be duplicative. What we'd like to do with this session is to really queue up some audience questions. Um, so I'll, I'll start and just uh, um, ask the first question. What major factors have increased the probability of this recovery approach versus uh, the one that previously was in place for the black-footed ferret? And Pete, you or John, why don't you tell me what you think? 
Well, I guess I'd start off, and John okay. can add to it. Uh, I think you listen to everybody involved. That's the main thing. And if you listen to everybody involved, you'll hear what challenges you need to address. What I would add is I think there's been a real emphasis now on the incentive portion of this program and the support program in terms of boundary control and plague management. I think early on, 30 years ago, we were working with willing landowners, as Pete pointed out. You got a lot of communication that has to take place, but it was mainly a landowner who was just willing to participate, and we couldn't deliver as much other than regulatory assurances. Whereas now, I think we're providing, we're trying to provide those incentives, both in terms of some financial compensation for supporting the prairie dogs, but also support in terms of managing boundary and plague, that it, it makes it uh, a little more attractive to a landowner. So I think that's the big thing that I think is going to get us there. Good points, gentlemen. So if we move on and maybe go to the stakeholder level of, of uh, um, Tom, then Ken, and Todd, just a few points. If you were to summarize, not necessarily with the ferret, but to summarize a successful species conservation recovery formula, what top two or three ingredients from your perspective come to mind? Tom? <coughs> well, much like what Pete has said, the, the, the truly successful recovery programs have involved all of the players that have a stake in the game. And uh, I, I feel that, that several of the amendments to the Act, including the Safe Harbor Agreement, uh, have gone a long way to relax some of the, the more stringent provisions of, of the Act. Kim, what do you think? Uh, well, the top three, one is, is no no harm, no foul, as we already described, that folks have complete uh, understanding that if they get involved with this, it will not impact their operation in a negative fashion. <laughs> the second, uh, and, and one that, that we've been talking about a real long time, are defined recovery goals and objectives, and we've done so with this species. We know, uh, we know as Pete stated, we know when we will be done with recovery of the species by the definition of number of acres and number of prairie dogs and number of states that are involved. And the third, of course, are the, the incentive programs. Let's go to Todd Heward, uh, the Wyoming rancher. Todd, give me a little bit of your perspective on that question. Well, I would agree, I would agree with what's been said. First off, you've got to recognize those who provide the habitat uh, for the wildlife species uh, respectfully and, and provide some assurances and some some means or incentives to, to participate. Secondly, uh, I, think, I think the process cannot be mandated upon local agencies. Uh, you know, they have to be involved at the ground level, stay involved. Uh, they're the, the local experts on it, and, and it can't just be top-down mandated to them. Thirdly, I would say, uh, uh, you know, a stronger look at the socioeconomic considerations of of ESA and, and species management and recovery, uh, you know, what is it? What is it doing to the local economies, the local people, and things of that nature? Well, I'm going to stick with you, Todd, just for a two-part question here because I'm I'm curious, and I've been asked this question myself a number of times. So, going back to the rancher, Todd Heward, as a landowner, Todd, how do you feel about wildlife? and being part of a conservation effort. Why do you care? Thank you. Um, you know, personally, we, we, we have always enjoyed wildlife, care about wildlife. I recognize that's not always the case, and that's important to recognize. I think this uh, recovery proposal does recognize that. It's not for everybody, and it doesn't need to be for everybody. Um, but certainly, when it comes to wildlife and its management, um, you know, and again, ESA, I, th I think there's some things that, that don't work that, that need to be addressed. But overall, um, I'm, I'm supportive of, of the black-footed ferret effort because I think it can be done right, an example of how we move forward with species through uh, Endangered Species Act and, and make some progress. And uh, so that's why I guess I, I continue to be interested in it and uh, supportive in in a positive way. So you go to your neighbor, Todd, and uh, 
you talk to him about this program, how do you, and, and I know convince is the wrong word for the ranching community. It's not, it's, you don't convince your neighbor. In many ways you may have a discussion with your neighbor and actually seek his or her cursory approval because they are your neighbor and you have to live together. But help, them, help me understand how you can chat with them about uh, safely having the most endangered mammal on North America on your land and potentially theirs and not live to regret it? Yeah, I think that's a critical question, Terry. Um, really, I, I, again, this this isn't for everybody and this isn't for every community. I think those relationships probably uh, exist long before things like this topic come about. Um, you know, this is gonna be successful in communities that already have neighbors that work together and respect each other and respect uh, their decisions and management and things of that nature. I don't necessarily see it happening in in situations where you've got continued conflict between neighbors and, and boundaries and things of that nature. Um, you know, it, it may be that uh, a landowner can, can go to their neighbor and, and with the, the proposed uh, mechanism that's being laid forth, uh, you know, convince that landowner that yes, it's going to work and there's there's assurances as part of it. Um, but it's important to recognize that may not exist everywhere. All right, Todd, thank you. Well, uh, I'm convinced, let's say. So I'm gonna pivot now to Pete Gober. And Pete, you know, black-footed ferret, uh, small little animal, he doesn't eat too many cattle. <laughs> Um, you know, he, he's not a, he's not a top tier predator unless you're a prairie dog. Um, he, uh, he's pretty, he comes out at night. He doesn't bother me too much. You've got pretty good protections for myself and my neighbor. What can we learn from this? What can lawmakers and regulators learn from this black footed ferret approach and story and apply to the ESA and other species in the future? Cause I know personally, that's something I'm really interested in. Well, I'll repeat myself from earlier. It's always best to listen. You know, listen 10 times for everything you say. Listen 10 times as much. And we can work with ferrets. The issue comes down to prairie dogs, as everyone has said, and there are going to be conflicts with prairie dogs. And we've got to realize that if private lands are hosting the party and you're calling it a potluck and nobody else brings any food and everybody shows up, there's going to be a lot of and continued conflict. Uh, if if the private landowner is going to provide a place for wildlife, then the public's going to receive the good from that wildlife being there. Then the public's got to help pay the way for the management of that wildlife. And we've done a lot of things to this continent in terms of impacts as far as wildlife habitat, but none have been larger for the ferret and prairie dog than the this exotic invasive species that's non-native to North America. That changes the whole game. If we can manage plague, this is a species that we can recover and recover in fairly short order given its high reproductive rate. If, if we can achieve that and set that as a model that the public good will be paid for by public dollars and the private landowner won't be adversely impacted. In fact, he'll be helped if he, if he chooses to participate and uh, receives compensation. Thanks, Pete. Well, that sounds interesting. I mean, it sounds like it might be a, a nice template, not only for landowners, but other natural resource users. Uh, sounds like the assurances are there. Let's drive back toward the state, though, because obviously this is a listed species, but the state, you know, the states play a role at some level into that. Um, and, but states also play a role in those um, species of concern, right? Those that, uh, that maybe aren't listed yet, but uh, they're they're somewhat on the short list. So regardless of listed or not listed, um, what what's the role of states? And let's let's talk to John and Ken about that. Uh, John, I want to hear what you have to say about that. John Emmerich, uh, and then Ken being actively involved is I want to come back to you to kind of summer, bring it back home for us. All prefix again. I, I'm not speaking for any state agency, but I'm speaking from my long experience uh, with a state agency and uh, you know, my familiarity with the ESA itself, there's, there's tremendous latitude within ESA in terms of what the states can do in terms of managing these species. I mean, the states really have the specific authority 
to manage wildlife within their state. Once it becomes threatened or enlisted, then of course ESA kicks in. But even under that listed status, um, there's tremendous flexibility within Section 6 and other portions of ESA for states to do a lot of the management. In fact, there's a lot of examples where the states are doing the, most, the majority of the, of, the, of the management. I think key, and Pete said it and several other people have said it, no matter who is doing most of the work, states or the feds, there just has to be good coordination and communication among all the players involved. But I think the Act actually provides a lot of latitude for states to be about as, as engaged as they want to be in, in, species, in endangered species management. Kim, Morgan, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, what do you think? Well, we agree. Our, we have in statute in our state under Title 33 that, the, that our agency is to manage wildlife of the state for the people of the state and the enjoyment of their visitors, and paraphrase from there on. And most of us in the West, I think, uh, believe in government at the most local level because that's where the people live and that's where decisions are made and that's where the folks who completely or should completely understand what's going on in that, in that particular area, or in our case, that particular wildlife landscape, uh, have the best and, and, and most current data and information, as well as the ability uh, through all of our field folks and working with all the NGOs that we work with in, in, in Colorado to cooperatively design funding opportunities as well as management, uh, management suggestions to manage the wildlife of our state. And given that, this, this perfectly falls into that model whereby uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service still has the authority over this species, but have given states and communities the opportunity to work together and develop programs for the recovery of the species. And uh, to, to further that, we, we are continuing to look at ways of, of developing this as a landscape approach. So, we're not only affecting, in a positive manner, uh, all species of prairie dogs as well as black-footed ferrets, but all the other uh, species that rely on those complexes to survive, many of which are species of concern at this time. Thank you, Ken. So you've convinced me a little bit here that the ESA is probably flexible enough um, and that we have to be willing to experiment, maybe, as times change. Uh, so it takes a bold, bold approach. And the question I'm about to ask is not intended to be incriminating of anybody necessarily, but I think there's, uh, Tom Doherty, you may have some insight in this. Um, and certainly National Wildlife Federation is not an entity that exercises uh, an egregious litigious front on these issues, but you may have some perspective. Tom, again, retired from the National Fish and Wild, or National Wildlife Federation, excuse me. Um, so if we do experiment, we do try new things uh, or under the ESA, uh, won't we see another gamut of lawsuits directed at agencies uh, and then indirectly landing in the laps of the states and landowners? Well, it, 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 nothing is ever foolproof. Anybody with a dollar and a lawyer can sue over anything they want to. The, from what I've seen under the provisions of the Act, the, the, the protections that are in place uh, are, are not going to necessarily prevent somebody from suing, but they're going to prevent them from winning. I just do not feel uh, that, it, 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 I, and I think in, certainly in this case, many conservation organizations, environmental organizations uh, would, would, uh, uh, would condemn uh, an abuse of, of, of that order. And well, thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. And I think part of the message there is a collaborative approach and the yeah. best way to dismantle um, an affront is to have really moderate and rational stakeholders from all elements around the table, and then you can be successful. And that's in part, I think, what this friends group and what uh, the process of Fish and Wildlife Services built. We've got a couple more minutes of moderated discussion here, and just to give a heads up to our uh, uh, our hosts uh, will be ready for questions, I think, in about two or three minutes. Um, let me ask two more questions, and one of these is um, about landscape scale conservation. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty important topic. It's one that, frankly, 
I had some concern over earlier in my career and still do to some extent that we talk about a species in, in, in direction of trying to bring multiple species into an ESA discussion. Where my mind's opened a little bit since then is that you can actually in some ways proactively invest in one, a single species and benefit multi-species. And so how does the Black-Footed Fair Recovery Program relate to the concept of landscape scale or multi-species conservation? And I'd like to look at the state agency here with Ken Morgan to answer that question and then move to Pete Gober from Fish and Wildlife Service to answer that. Okay, uh, Ken Morgan again. Uh, I, I briefly touched on it on my previous statements, but the fact of the matter is, is that uh, prairie dogs are a very important species for short grass prairie ecosystems, period. And, and a large litany of, of uh, species depend on the actions of those mammals in order to provide homes and, and food source for themselves, specifically swift fox, Mossasaga rattlesnake, uh, burrowing owl, you know, tell me when to quit, <laughs> Bruges hawk. And so the, the, the objective, of course, is that if we can maintain and, and scientifically prove that we are maintaining that large-scale ecosystem, then as Terry was mentioning, we can get proactively involved with saying that those species, by the very nature of conservation efforts for one specific species, is going to benefit many. And in our, from our state agency perspective, that is absolutely the only way that you manage wildlife populations. You can't do it a critter at a time. Thank you. Pete, what do you think? I concur with Ken. He said it all. I like concise answers. That's great. <laughs> so we're going to ask one last question. We're going to do a round robin on that. One, one idea, one point, one parting point from each of you in the order that we did the presentation. Um, so if you could change one aspect of the ESA, not necessarily legislatively, what would it be? And let's talk uh, with Todd Heward, uh, rancher from Wyoming first. Todd? I would, uh, I would say that all decisions and things need to be done based on science and not politics. Okay. Thank you, Todd. P, you may or may not be able to answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What, what would yours be? Your well, well, as a staff person way down the chain, I'll just quote a uh, quote from our director. The Endangered Species Act is not broken, it's starved. Fair enough. Kim Morgan, Parks and Wildlife in Colorado. I think uh, as we go through all these discussions with species and landscapes that we, uh, we ensure that we are producing known production goals and uh, uh, objectives for delisting and non-listing of those species. We know where we're going, that we have a we have a road map and we'll know when we're successful at the end of that opportunity. And stick to it. And stick, and stick to, it. to it, absolutely. Thank you, Ken. Tom Doherty, retired, NWF. Well, mine's very similar to Pete's. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I, truly believe in the act. It's a very popular act and has maintained its popularity since its enactment in 1978. But <clears throat> That doesn't mean that, that the money follows the popularity, uh, the funding uh, for to provide to uh, the various agencies and individuals to be actually achieve recovery is sometimes a very insurmountable uh, obstacle. Gentlemen, I'm drafting the legislation as we speak, so I appreciate uh, I appreciate your comments. So let's let's now pivot to our host. Oh, sorry, John. I'm going to leave John out. John, you have the last word. John Emmerich. All right. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'll reemphasize one of the points that uh, uh, Ken made is that it, it's very important that once a recovery plan and goals are set, we stick to those plans. Uh, unfortunately, there's been examples recently that it, it, it undermines people's strength and trust in what we're trying to do. So I think that's very critical. But the one thing I would add is I think the priority system, you know, we talk about the not enough duck dollars to do everything, and that's obviously the case. But I think with endangered species, we've got to do a better job of setting our priorities. I think we need to put the money into those species that are truly 
near extinction or threatened. And also those species that have the biggest impact on the landscape in terms of affecting so many other species. And I think, again, the black-footed ferret is a perfect example. It is truly a threatened species that needs dollars for recovery. And it truly benefits a lot of other species that we can purposely manage that species. Unfortunately, I think some of the dollars, because of political emphasis, goes toward species that shouldn't be as high a priority as some of these other species. So I think we need to look at the priority, the way we set priorities for ESA. Thank you, John. Uh, so now, correctly, we will pivot back to our hosts from Western Governors, and I believe our next step is to move into Q&A from the webinar participants. This is our top question. Bear with me here. I'm going to read uh, from the screen. Uh, can Pete or any of the other panelists tell me how many landowners have enrolled in the programmatic safe harbor agreement and how much acreage has been enrolled? One byline to that, Pete, talk to us about if you don't enroll, too. Yeah, that's good. If you don't enroll, you're covered, you're covered under our safe harbor. You're not your neighbor. Oh, okay. I understand now. Sure, uh, and Ken can help me here because a lot of that activity has happened in the state of Colorado over the last few years. We've added five new reintroduction sites since 2013 in Colorado. There have probably been a dozen plus landowners with in the neighborhood of five to 10,000 acres of habitat signed up, Ken. We've also enrolled a property in Kansas of about 10,000 acres. We've enrolled a ranch in Arizona, of a large ranch there, the SP Ranch that belongs to the Babbitt family. Uh, so we're just getting started with the programmatic safe harbor effort, but there are dozens of people involved in tens of thousands of acres. Ken, can you elaborate any more on no, the that's a, uh, summation? We, uh, as I stated in my opening comments, we had a huge response to, to uh, the incentive program. And I did mention that we had 50 applicants. Uh, of that, only nine qualified because in order to have blackfooted ferrets released on your property for blacktail prairie dogs, you have to have a minimum 1,500 acres, and that's a lot of prairie dogs. But uh, the NRCS plan also allows neighboring landowners to conjoin those acreages so that several landowners can make up that 1,500 acres and they all receive the same benefits. Yeah, Terry and John uh, highlighted, I wanted to speak to how we handled uh, neighbors in that that didn't want to participate. And it's getting a little bit down in the weeds, but forgive me for a moment. Uh, when we issue a safe harbor permit to a landowner, we're working really closely with them. There's a reintroduction plan. Everybody knows what they need to do. The uh, landowner can withdraw at any time. But his neighbors are not covered for the take of animals. Let's say the landowner wanted to plow his ranch into corn and we were going to lose prairie dogs and ferrets. The landowner can do that via the safe harbor permit. If his neighbors decide to do that and a ferret happened to get over there, they're covered through the biological opinion on the issuance of the permit to do the same thing. So in essence, we've told folks, if you'll host black-footed ferrets, we're willing to lose all of them in the event you change your mind, but we know the West well enough to know that the best and highest use of this land is going to be livestock production in the future, and likely these things are going to be compatible with operations if we do them the right way. And I can tell you that was a very significant point in landowners being willing to sign up because their neighbors we're also taking care of. This is Terry with Colorado Cattlemen. So let's, let's move to another question here, and this goes specific to the 10J status, which I believe goes toward Wyoming more specifically. But uh, what are the criteria of species populations uh, to attain 10J status, and how important has that been for implementing the recovery plan? John Emmerich, I mean, do you want to speak to that I'll, issue? I'll give a, uh, a first stab, but I think Pete can probably provide more of the detail, but uh, Wyoming uh, started, when they started their first reintroduction back in 91, uh, they, they developed a regional 10J experimental uh, non-essential population 10J status, which, which Wyoming has become comfortable with. It provides protections not only for the private landowners, but protections on public lands. It's a little different approach. There's some nuances between that and, and the safe harbor. Uh, Wyoming has recently expanded that uh, 10J designation to the entire state. Uh, but there's, I guess, yeah, there's two different approaches. One is safe harbor, 
which provides, which is specifically designed for the private landowner, but it also provides protection for the neighbors through a little different approach. 10J is just another way of doing business. One thing about 10J, though, is it typically takes a long time to get it done, whereas Safe Harbor, now that we have a programmatic Safe Harbor in place, a landowner could literally enroll in that within a very, very short period of time. I think we should thank one of our our participants for that. I believe I saw Mr. Michael Bean on, on yes. the webinar. So, <laughs> Pete, do you have anything to add to that from Fish and Wildlife? Well, of course, Todd was numero uno and some of his neighbors as far as ferrets going into Shirley Basin back in 1991, and there were no ferrets there to begin with with respect to the population status, so they had to be willing to take it on. Uh, the short answer is it's been really important because uh, the 10J can deal with both private lands and federal lands in one fell swoop, and a, a designation by area changes the status of the species to where it can be worked with more easily. If, uh, again, getting down in the weeds a little bit, but it's no longer threatened or endangered for the purposes of uh, Section 7 consultation. So the 10J has been very important in, in that regard. Absolutely. So let's go to the next question. Uh, this talks about uh, a lot of great work on private lands, and the, the participant wants to know about the application of various ESA incentives on federal lands. I'd like to throw in one word beside, besides incentives, and that's assurances, because I think that's the, the key element. Todd, uh, who are, do you want to do you want to compare and contrast private and federal land related to incentives and insurances for us from a rancher perspective? Well, I may, <clears throat> I may not be the best to talk specific to federal lands um, and, and how incentives work uh, in regards to federal lands. We, you know, I've never seen an incentive program to this point, so uh, I don't know what those details would be on federal lands. The assurances side of federal lands um, I applaud the state of Wyoming for design, you know, the, the statewide designation of the 10J because it uh, it really covers all aspects of land ownership in that regard. Maybe somebody else can speak better to, uh, you know, the effects of of the, the program on federal land. Pete, would you do you want to make any comment? I mean, I'm more than willing to talk about assurances on federal lands. Well, um, just real quick, but uh, I'd love to hear from you. Well, if you're talking about ESA assurances that they're not going to be uh, deleterious regulatory impacts on landowners, we we start off with a, a whole list. We we. We first started off with ferrets with these experimental non-essential 10J areas, so to speak. Then we've got, developed the programmatic safe harbor that is specific to private landowners. We've also used uh, a permitting authority to provide assurances to landowners. We've also used the Section 7 consultation process, most recently on the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge. There's a variety of ways to US, use ESA to alleviate the regulatory concerns of people on the land. Absolutely. I, for for us, uh, this is Terry Fink, as our Colorado Cattlemen's Law Ad Lib, just barely. Um, I think incentives can be applied across land ownership. Um, it's just about how we tailor those and, and implement those, uh, or should be. Uh, the assurances is very important. Uh, as you're a permitted livestock grazer or other permits on federal lands, we've long since held the notion that we can't provide as uh, as an agency, as agencies or, or the gov federal government, we can't apply the degree of assurances that we can on private land. And I, I think we've got to get there. We've got to acknowledge that that is somewhat of an artificial hurdle um, to species conservation, and we've got to be able to work through it. But from a landowner's perspective, it needs to be worked through before landowners are going to be eager to do anything on federal lands is the short answer to that. Well, and you know, I'd like to thank Terry and Ken and others who went through this programmatic safe harbor and Ken, John who went through the language of these 10J rules so that we can address the concerns that are there because an individual landowner is not going to want to hear about, you know, biological opinions and how am I protected. They're going to look to their neighbors and people they've worked with to say, did it, did it help you or did it hurt you? And they, they want to feel confident that somebody's gone through these items line by line as you guys did during the development. 
So our next question really kind of deviates from a black-footed ferret program to some large extent, but it does speak toward compensatory mitigation, which is another non-regulatory way of meeting um, potentially, well, not as heavily as regulated, as me in meeting, um, uh, providing offsets to the impacts, say if it's from an energy industry, transmission and things along those lines. And of course there's a, there's an influence of the market uh, specifically in the industry, uh, energy industry on, on how much compensatory mitigation is needed. Talk to us about programs outside of Blackfooted Ferret, which really doesn't have a compensatory mitigation element to it. It's a true um, invested conservation program. But, but talk to us about the value or the need of pairing um, agency invested um, uh, conservation efforts uh, even if you're going to do a compensatory mitigation piece like many states are looking at the greater sage grouse. Anybody want to tackle that a little bit? Well, in Colorado, and I'll, I'll point to Terry. Uh, this is Ken Morgan, by the way. Um, I'll point to Terry. Uh, the Cattlemen's Association, in conjunction with uh, NGOs and, and our state agency, have developed a habitat exchange that is just that very issue of mitigation opportunities. We also have a lesser prairie chicken range-wide conservation plan that involves mitigation opportunities uh, for those who are using lands for other than farming and ranching. Um, obviously, those are going to ebb and flow with the market just like everything else does, but uh, I've been around a pretty long time now. Some might say too long, but uh, any time we get a, a bust in the energy, you can rest assured in the energy prices, you can rest assured they're going to come back. And uh, it's just a fluctuation in the market. But what we have discovered thus far, especially with lesser prey chicken, is that we have been able to uh, bankroll a good amount of funding for lesser prey chicken conservation range wide. And that is, again, another tool in the toolbox that we ought to be using. And I'm very optimistic that. Uh, Cattlemen's Association's mitigation uh, uh, opportunities are going to work well for greater sage grouse as well. And we'll harken back to the notion, this is Terry with Colorado Cattlemen's Association, it is good to, com to pair compensatory mitigation approaches also with the ability to invest in conservation um, for, for reasons that aren't associated with mitigation. I reflect on Pete Gober's comment earlier um, as he talked about investing for the public good. In many ways, it's all of our responsibility to care for these species, and there has to, uh, over time, if to be successful, have some sort of reliable investment stream for these species. And that's a, that's a to be done. Uh, we've talked about funding here today, and uh, it's certainly something we should work on. Let me move to um, with uh, another question, and this this is a two part question, and it's. It's asking, have you paired the safe harbor agreement with candidate conservation agreements with assurances to affect conservation of associated species? So linked the safe harbor for ferret to a candidate conservation agreement with assurances for another species. And secondarily, they're just asking for a website for the friends group. So let me let me let Pete, answer this technical question, and then I'll go to John Emmerich for information on the Friends Group. The short answer on pairing with CCAAs is no, but in practice, conservation is occurring for those species. Thank you. John, are you prepared to tell us how we learn a bit more about the Friends Group? Uh, yes. Um, they can give me a call. <laughs> And it's 307-421-0570. Uh, and uh, we are working on a, a website uh, that uh, will provide additional information. It will be under the Waffle website. But if, if uh, I, I don't have it right now. So I, I guess right this, at this point in time, just give me a call and I will forward information. In, and not too distant future, we will have a website. Uh, org set up that people can go to. Absolutely. Well, thank you. So let's move to another question here. What would the recovery options for black-footed ferret have been 
if you hadn't found private landowners willing to participate in the reintroduction? Let's drill this into Colorado for a second and take advantage of Ken Morgan to answer that question. Uh, thank you. Yeah, they'd be minimum, uh, minimal, I should say. We did have a, a black-footed parrot release uh, up in the Wolf Creek area in northwestern Colorado some years ago, and uh, that involved a, a great deal of, of public land as well as private land. Uh, unfortunately, that population plagued out, going back to one of some of Pete's earlier comments that plague is a limiting factor to this. But uh, I, I can tell you from firsthand, if I were to go to any ag organization and say, you know, we want you to grow more prairie dogs for us because we've got all these other species we want to deal with, will you work with us? Um, we probably wouldn't have gotten very far at all. I'm just a wild guess at that. But creating this objective uh, that allows for uh, landowners to have no harm, no foul, some, some uh, voluntary incentives. Again, going back to one of my initial slides for black uh, for black tail prairie dogs in Colorado, that's an Eastern Plains species, and 89% of that is privately owned. And all of the release sites that we have done under this new incentive program have been in eastern Colorado. Now we have had, this is Pete, we, we have had a disproportionate number of sites on tribal lands, a half a dozen reservations across the west, and, and that's been real useful. And we've had a number of sites on federal lands, or mixed federal lands and private lands, uh, a couple of national wildlife refuge, a national grasslands, BLM lands, et cetera. But what I've found in dealing with folks is if you're dealing with a landowner and his family and his neighbors, that's a less bureaucratic pathway to getting ferrets on the ground than working with federal lands where there are a multitude of stakeholders and interests and it will take you a lot longer to get where you want to go. Thank you, Pete. So this appears it might be near the last question. Um, Blackfoot is very unique case in that no wild populations really existed when in reintroduction began. Does that make a difference when we talk about applying lessons learned from this recovery effort to other species? Well, I'll explain myself. This Pete is Pete over. again. Um, but starting from zero makes you humble. You know, if you start with a few and the regulatory uh, issues related to Section 7, it doesn't necessarily start you on an even footing with everybody, and starting off on an even footing with everybody gives everybody a sense of confidence we've got to work together. And I think the lesson here is don't get to zero yep. before you get creative, mm -hmm. before you engage stakeholders. You design a program that will work. Mm -hmm. Don't get to zero. So I'm, I'm looking around the room here. I think there might be a tidbit of information for our uh, for contact. John Emmerich, have you... Uh, uh, he's been negotiating with satellites to get some technology <laughs> responses here. So, John, what do you have? This is John Emmerich again. As far as the Friends Group goes, uh, we have set up a 501c3 account and a 501c4 account, and they're being hosted by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. So, at this juncture, you know, if people want to donate to the effort in terms of financially, uh, they can go to the uh, www WAFWA, that just stands for Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, dot org. And uh, that's, a, that's an entry into these uh, accounts that have been set up for donations. And, uh, and like I say, we're working on putting together a, a, another site for people to get information about what's going on with the Friends Group as, and then the overall Blackfoot Affair recovery effort. Thank you, John. So. We'll end here and turn it back to our Western Governors Association host, but from Todd Huard uh, in Wyoming, Pete Gober, Fish and Wildlife Service, Kim Morgan, Colorado Parks and Wildlife Service, Tom Doherty, Retired National Wildlife Federation, and John Emmerich, Wyoming Game and Fish, and myself, retired. Terry, retired, <laughs> excuse me, um, uh, myself, Terry Vankhauser, Colorado Cattlemen's Association, we'd like to thank you for this opportunity and hope that you found it informative. So I'll turn it back over to our hosts.
Thank you, Terry. Um, and thank you to all the panelists. We really appreciate that. Uh, this is Zach Budding with WGA again. Thank you all for attending the first webinar in the Western Governors Species Conservation and ESA Initiative webinar series. I really want to thank everyone for the insightful discussion. That was great. Um, for attendees, please look for a wrap-up email to come uh, tomorrow or early next week that will have a link to the webinar recording on YouTube and a summary of key discussion points brought up today. Also, please remember to view our online resource library for the Species Conservation and ESA Initiative. You can find that at westgov.org. And finally, please keep an eye out for our second webinar in the series, which will occur on February 4th. That webinar will address critical habitat and invasive species. Thank you all again for attending. I hope to see you at our next webinar. You did a great job.